Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to panel five on building and breaking border confidence. I am Narda Carranza from the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, and I will be your chair for this session. Today, we have a distinguished group of panelists who will be sharing their insights on various aspects related to electoral integrity, political trust, and combating misinformation. We also have a discussant who will be providing valuable feedback on the presentations. Now, let's introduce our panelists. The first panelist is Atije Mete Dokuyu from Vilcant University. She will be presenting on the role of electoral fraud and winning and losing for mass effective polarization, cross-national evidence. Next, we have Claudia Mayordomo from the University of Murcia. Claudia will present her research title could be parity a predictor of countries with a high perception of electoral integrity across national proposal to study. Joining us from the University of Sheffield, we have Hazel Gordon. Along with her co-authors Tom Stafford and Catherine Domet, she brings a presentation title, Are Political Trust Orientations Predictive of How Citizens Will Interpret Online Political Advertising Transparency Disclosures? <laughs> Our final panelist is Ana Julia Bonsanini Bernardi. Uh, she will be discussing combating misinformation in the political sphere, lessons learned from the 2022 Brazilian elections. A study he, she co-authored with Rodrigo Stam from UFRGS. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. If you cannot, please let me know or let any of the panelists know uh, via the chat, okay? Okay, our discussion for today is Joseph Claver from the University of Passa. Joseph will provide insightful comments and reflections on the presentations. We look forward to hearing you, Joseph. Each panelist will have 10 to 15 minutes to present their research findings. After the presentations, uh, we will allow 15 minutes for Joseph to share uh, his comments. Following that, we will open the floor for questions and answers. Okay. Thank you once again for joining us today. Uh, we are very excited to listen to all these diverse and marvelous panelists. Uh, without further ado, let's begin with our first presentation by Atije. Atije is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at Bilkan University. She also received her master's degree there. Uh, her research interests are party politics, public opinion, and comparative political behavior. Atije, we are happy to have you here. Please start your presentation. Thank you, Narda, for this introduction. Um, I just want to mention that I recently received my PhD at Michigan University, it's quite recent. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. Uh, well, in my study, I'm focusing on the role of uh, electoral manipulative strategies. Uh, it is part of my PhD thesis, actually. Uh, it was a chapter of my PhD thesis. And in my PhD thesis, overall, um, I looked at the, the terms of political polarization and I considered the role of party strategies. And uh, in this study, I'm looking at the role of electoral manipulative strategies and how voting for a winning versus losing party matters in shaping political polarization in the eyes of the citizens. So um, uh, overall political polarization refers to social or ideological distance between groups or parties. So polarization can be at the mass level or party system level. And the standard question that motivates this research is how and why do citizens perceive parties effectively apart from each other? So I'm interested in determinants of uh, effective polarization. And I consider the role of party strategies because parties rely on certain strategies to attract more voters. And citizens are active and responsive to these strategies. The literature shows that uh, they can be responsive to parties in queues or issue positions provided by parties. These strategies um, make the elect elect electoral competition easier uh, for citizens. And the literature on party strategies mainly focused on some program programmatic party strategies, but there are alternative party strategies as well. And I am focusing on one of the, these party strategies, which is manipulative electoral strategies. 
And uh, I argue that these kind of strategies have some effective consequences for citizens. So it shapes citizens' perceptions and feelings about parties. And I'm interested in mass affective polarization, and it refers to the degree to which uh, citizens perceive opposing parties and its supporters negatively, and their own party and its supporters positively. So it refers to emotional distance as perceived by citizens. And um, well, in my um, theoretical assumptions, the first uh, variable that I'm looking at is the electoral fraud, uh, which refers to actions that impair electoral quality before, uh, during, or after an election. And there are both direct and uh, indirect effects mentioned in the literature. And um, it can directly uh, affect the elect electoral uh, election results. Uh, it can bring electoral victory to a political party, or it can indirectly shape citizens and uh, political uh, actors uh, perceptions. And uh, I'm interested in indirect effects uh, on citizens' perceptions and feelings about political parties. And under electoral fraud, uh, voters can lose their interest in politics. Uh, they can detach from politics because they might feel that uh, nothing will ever change under these circumstances. Or they can feel anger or bias uh, toward these manipulative strategies. And um, or they can support the manipulator party uh, through some cognitive mechanisms of selective exposure to information and uh, motivated skepticism. So they might uh, already exposed to some kind of uh, biased information and uh, they might never heard about it or uh, they might reject this kind of information altogether or they might even blame the other parties for making false accusations. So under uh, these circumstances, I. Uh, expect, expect electoral manipulative strategies uh, to have a positive effect on uh, effective polarization as perceived by citizens. Uh, apart from electoral fraud, I'm most interested in whether voting for a winning versus losing party matters for citizens' perception. So social psychology literature suggests that winning leads to some pleasant feelings and decreased stress, but losing leads to opposite feelings. So losers, those I mean, those who voted for the losing parties, uh, losing party will have a psych some uh, psychological discomfort due to voting for the losing party. And uh, to decrease this kind of discomfort, uh, they will see parties as similar to each other. So they will uh, adjust their cognitive thinking from my party was the best one to my party was not really the best one, or there's not much difference party between parties. But Winners will not have such cognitive dissonance and uh, they will perceive their uh, existing beliefs that their support party is distinctly, distinctively apart from other parties. So I argue that mass affective polarization should be higher among supporters of the winners, uh, winning party than the supporters of the losing party. And apart from their uh, direct effects, I'm most interested in their interaction. So what happens when there are electoral injustices? And uh, under electoral injustices, losers uh, will rely on some causal attribution. So they will blame these kind of uh, manipulative strategies uh, for electoral fraud. And uh, they will make some causal att attributions of voting for the losing party. And uh, while electoral uh, manipulative strat strategies induce eff effective polarization, I argue that this relationship should be stronger for those who have voted for the losing party. And um, in my data, I'm relying on public opinion survey data from the comparative study of electoral systems. And I'm focusing on lower house elections only. And uh, I have uh, available data for 48 countries uh, for the 150 country elections uh, between 1996 and 2020. And uh, I'm using multi-level modeling in my analysis because I have both individual level data as well as the election level data. And my dependent variable is affective polarization. And uh, I the, this variable is at the individual level. And I'm using uh, the quest, um, survey item from the CSCS. Uh, respondents were asked to place parties uh, between zero and 10, like this flag scale. And this is uh, similar to thermometer scale used in the US. And my main independent variables uh, are electoral integrity and winner loser status. Uh, electoral integrity is from the International Institute for Democracy, and um, 
and elect election assistance project. And in this uh, date, in this variable, higher values indicate uh, higher electoral integrity. And this uh, variable uh, has the value between zero and one. And it is election level variable. And winner loser status uh, relies on the respondent vote choice for the party list in the previous national election. And uh, this kind of information is provided in the CSTS again. And uh, those respondents who voted for a party that was part of the government uh, in the previous election are were coded as the winners. And there are also some uh, control variables uh, at both at the uh, election level and the uh, individual level. And I'm doing some robustness tests to see my results are the same. And uh, I have some one alternative measurement for electoral integrity, which is from the perceptions of electoral integrity data. And uh, I also additionally control for the effect of single member districts and presidential system and federalism in my analysis. And uh, I distinguish my countries as the new versus old democracies and uh, to see if being old, new versus old democracy has any uh, uh, effect uh, in this relationship. Well, um, the, when we look at the dispersion of effective polarization, as you can see, there are some countries such as Romania and uh, Mexico are more dispersed than other countries such as uh, Brazil and um, Argentina. And uh, electro electoral integrity level is dispersed as well. And uh, except for the 2005 German election, uh, none of the countries has the perfect level of uh, electoral integrity, which is one. So it means that every country has some level of electoral fraud uh, in their country election. Well, empirical findings show that uh, manipulative electoral strategies has a direct, have a direct and positive effect on perceived effective polarization. When the uh, electoral integrity level is at the, uh, at the high level, we see we have uh, low levels of effective polarization. And when the electoral integrity level is uh, low, we have a high level of uh, mass effective polarization. And uh, when we look at the winner versus loser effect, winners uh, perceive slightly higher uh, mass effective polarization than losers, uh, which again supports my hypothesis. It's, uh, this relationship is statistically significant. And uh, I was also interested in their uh, interaction. So their interaction, uh, the interaction between electoral integrity and winner loser status is also statistically significant. And marginal effects of electoral integrity on uh, effective polarization is negative and uh, statistically distinguishable from zero for both winners and losers. But this negative effect is slightly higher for winners than losers. And marginal effects of voting uh, for uh, winners versus losers on effective polarization is again statistically significant at all levels of electoral integrity and it is uh, positive, but uh, it is particularly large um, at low levels of electoral integrity. So whether one is winner uh, or loser matters, la matters less in countries with uh, high levels of electoral integrity, but when the electoral integrity levels is low, being one, uh, winner or loser matters more. And these results are robust to uh, alternative measurement of electoral integrity, and uh, when it is also robust to uh, additionally controlling for uh, single member districts, federalism, and presidentialism. And uh, I also distinguish countries as uh, new versus old democracies, and my results are similar when I con additionally control for this variable as well. So sum up, this study provides a link between party strategies and uh, cognitive mechanisms of uh, information processing and attitude formation among the public. And it provides a better understanding of what shapes citizens' attitudes towards uh, parties. And empirical evidence in this study suggests that uh, electoral integrity shapes citizens' perceptions and feelings towards parties. And being winner and loser matters for citizens. And it is especially important when the electoral integrity is low. And uh, there has been already a debate about the link between political polarization and democratic decline. And uh, I think if you if you look at the indicators, some indicators of democratic decline, such as uh, electoral fraud, we may uh, uncover their relationship better. And uh, this study also contributes to theoretical literature on uh, intergroup conflict and winner loser status. 
But this research can be further expanded uh, by identifying separate suspects of electoral fraud as well, because uh, existing literature suggests that pers uh, citizens perceive uh, separate aspects of electoral fraud, such as vote buying, uh, pragmatic and positive within other uh, strategies. So uh, future studies might identify these separate suspects to see if, they, uh, if their effect is, uh, are the same uh, with respect to their perceptions of uh, parties. And future studies might also investigate different periods of the periods of the electoral cycle and uh, whether this the degree of the electoral integrity is, uh, is the same at the different uh, periods of the electoral cycle, because existing literature suggests that citizens perceive less effective polarization as elections become less salient. So different periods of the electoral cycle and different levels of electoral integrity uh, might have different effect on citizens' perceptions of parties. And uh, I hope this study contributes to this ongoing debate on uh, polarization and democratic decline. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Hatije. It was a very interesting presentation. I hope to read your dissertation soon. And I hope you publish it soon online. It's very, very complete and interesting. But we have to move on to the next presentation now. Uh, joining us from the University of Murcia is Claudia Mayordomo. Claudia Mayordomo Zapata is a pre-doctoral pre FPU, FPU fellow hired by the Ministry of Universities. She's conducting her doctoral thesis on gender and politics. She's a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Murcia. Uh, she's also a research assistant at CEMOP since 2019 and is a member of the editorial board of the journal Mass Poder Local, More Local Power. Claudia, we cannot wait to hear you also. Thank you. I'm going to share the, the screen. So this is an, an early... I don't know how to make this big. Okay, no. um, so this is a, an early research. It's in an early stage of design, but my my supervisor told me to to apply for for this conference. So sorry if if this is not that uh, finished, but I would like to know how do you think about this, this idea. So the title of this research is Could, could be parity a predictor of countries with high perception of electoral integrity, a gross national proposal to study. As I said, it's a, an exploratory, exploratory research. We still don't know much about parity democracy because there are a little, a little few in the world and, and we had a, a previous empirical evidence that the greater presence of women in institutions increased the legitimacy of the system. And as far as I know, as far as I research and, and read the, the previous literature, but may, maybe I, I missed something. Uh, there is no empirical analysis about the relationship between the perception of electoral integrity and the descriptive representation of women. So I try to link this idea of the, the higher the higher presence of women in, in chambers, the higher levels of legitimacy of the system and, and then the, the higher perception of electoral integrity because they, they are connected. So uh, the research question of this proposal is if parity and perception of electoral integrity are related. And the, the hypothesis to work with is regimes with a higher percent, percentage of women in their national le legislative flow chamber that is, their parliaments will have a higher probability of having a higher uh, perception of electoral integrity index. The, the results, I'm, I'm super fast because this is just, again, an explanatory 
research, but the result from a multi-level regression models, I, I made three, three different regression models, uh, indicate that the percentage of women in the principal chamber has a positive and significant effect on the, on the perceived electoral in integrity index made by experts. Then suggesting that higher representation of women may contribute to greater electoral integrity. And maybe we can think that this is something obvious, but uh, we know, or some, some literature said that uh, non-democratic regimes are using the, the level of women at the chamber, are they representative chambers as le, le, legitimacy factor to like um like an image to the to the world, like no, we, we have equality. So I was interested on this. These are the, the regression models. The percentage of women at the low chamber is always statistically significant. And well, this is uh, where, where I'm most interested in this presentation because I would like to address with you some doubts about how to make a deeper analysis of the relationship between the perception of electoral integrity index and the descriptive representation of women. When I first designed this, this paper, I, I thought that I could uh, compare the, the expert's perception with the citizens, but I'm not sure how to do this because beyond, going beyond to descriptive um, with a description of the data because the, there are different sam samples. So any idea on how to compare this with a robust uh, analysis. And I'm also have doubts, some doubts about how to compare the perception of men and women in parity regimes. I mean, um, in the expert level, how should I combine the, the, the variable being a female or a male expert and the person of women at the chamber? I, I don't know if an, an interaction will be okay. And finally, the, the last uh, issue I, I would like to, to address here is how to study beyond the descriptive the difference between non-democratic parity regimes versus democratic parity, parity regimes because they are like 30 in the, in the world right now, according to the data from the NGO, from the ONU. I don't, I don't know how to say in English the, the letters, but yeah, so, so I know that a comparative study will be okay, but, but how to do it in a um, ro robust way? And this is all. So thank you for your attention. Any comments are welcome. Thank you so much, Claudia. Your research speaks of a great creative point of view about this index and I cannot wait also to hear what our discussion will uh, provide in terms of answers to your questions. It is a very interesting uh, research design so congratulations for that. Um, thank you for sharing once again. Next we have Hazel Gordon from the University of Sheffield uh, she will be presenting uh, her work uh, written along with her co-authors Tom Stafford and Catherine Domet. Uh, Hazel is a PhD student at the University of Sheffield. Tom Stafford is a professor of cognitive science at the same university. And Catherine Domet is also a professor of digital politics in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Sheffield too. Uh, I just want to add before Hazel's presentation that you can leave your questions for our panelists in the chat box and we can read them at the end of this panel. Hazel, we look forward to listen to you. Hi, yeah, so thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. 
Um, so yeah, it's just me today, but uh, Tom and Kate are my uh, supervisors on my PhD project. Uh, so my project is focused on looking at do digital imprints appear to affect the citizen uh, trust evaluations um, of political advertisements. And um, sort of the political background for this research is that, as you might know, the UK government introduced a new legisl legislation that uh, for the next election, uh, all online political advertisements need to have one of these disclaimers. Um, and they communicate information such as uh, was the advert paid for and who was it paid for by um, and increasingly being used uh, included is whether or not these adverts have been micro targeted towards specific individuals based on information uh, sort of collected about them online. And uh, so the UK government is only requiring this, this first bit of information, um, but because issues around micro-targeting are fairly central in these discussions of what citizens kind of need to know when viewing political ads, um, we've also kind of looked at this in the research. So um, the sort of need for these digital imprints has arisen because there's been evidence that across a range of um, democracies during election times, uh, there has been sort of citizens have been seeing fake ads and, and misinformation online. Um, and so, and then they have very few ways to sort of verify the legitimacies um, of the ads that they see. And so, um, so digital imprints are being introduced to, to tackle this, tackle this problem. And um, as the more they're introduced, the more that um, it's been looked into uh, sort of the effectiveness of them. So particularly how much are they noticed as it is a key sort of part of um, what's been looked at. Um, and also, do they achieve what they set out to? So, so predominantly they aim to kind of uh, increase uh, information that citizens have, but also it's hoped that um, they will uh, increase citizen trust. And this is kind of hoped on, on two levels. There's the more abstracted level of, of trust in the regulation of elections, um, but there's also kind of the immediate micro level of trust in kind of the advertiser. And, and it's hoped that when um, these become sort of a normal part of political campaigning, uh, that citizens will be able to use these digital imprints as a way to assess the credibility and, and trustworthiness of, of advertisers um, when they view these um, when they view these ads. Um, however, what this research was interested in looking at was um, does there appear to be uh, unanticipated consequences? Um, to this uh, sort of on that micro level. So um, this was kind of question was, was motivated by uh, political transparency research in different political contexts that shown that sometimes increasing political transparency can, can have backfire effects on trust. And increasing political transparency, it always communicates sort of extra new information to citizens. Um, and it's it sort of theorized that the reason why these backfire effects can happen is because um, individuals sort of respond to the information specifics um, and don't sort of connect with connect this with the wider sort of uh, signifying that political transparency has been increased uh, and they just respond to that information that, that's immediately in front of them. Um, and so what we did in this in, in this project was designed an experimental study to, to test to, uh, to see if these backfire effects appear to be happening in this context. Um, and also what was hoped um, was to sort of look at whether or not different individuals sort of uh, react differently to the same information. So, so experimental research in other contexts has shown that uh, pre-existing levels of political trust are sort of important predictors of how people ev will evaluate political transparency. And particularly those with low pre-existing political trust um, are, are kind of where these backfire effects appear to be limited to. So the specific question for this experiment was, um, do pre-existing levels of political trust appear to predict different evaluations of political uh, transparency disclaimers? Um, and just to talk a bit about how political trust was conceptualized. So typically it's sort of um, in the transparency trust area, it's sort of measured on just that one dimension of, of trust. However, um, recent, more recent conceptualizations now sort of identify these three distinct dimensions of political trust. And uh, this is quite empirically useful because um, when you have find that you have low trust, it can sometimes be difficult to know exactly what this indicates. And the absence of trust is sort of theorized to potentially indicate increases in distrust or increases in mistrust. Um, and these two sort of uh, dimensions have quite different connotations attached to them. So, so distrust is typically associated with cynicism and sort of withdrawals from politics, which obviously in a democracy is, is not great. However, the idea of mistrust, which has been very um, thoroughly developed by uh, Pippa Norris, 
Um, it's this idea that citizens will, will closely monitor political actors and that they will um, base any trust judgments made uh, on what can be verified with evidence. So, so the lack of trust um, potentially indicates one of these two things and, and it's helpful to be able to distinguish between the two. Um, and so we measured uh, all three of these dimensions, sort of di define them as like an orientation towards politics. Um, and it was expected that the more strongly an individual aligns with the beliefs, emotions and behaviours um, of one of these trust orientations, uh, the more this will influence uh, their evaluations made in the political domain. So, so we use this to kind of make predictions um, about how people might process these digital imprints. So it was expected uh, that for those who are highly distrusting, this, these will be uh, uh, predicted to have backfire effects to their response to this information, particularly a sort of micro-targeting information that, that ties into fairly controversial debates about privacy online. Um, and also that those who are highly mistrusting uh, would potentially be more skeptical of all advertisers, but, but importantly would be more likely to scrutinize the information on the digital imprint and, and notice this more. So this slide is sort of um, uh, showing the design of the study. So it was an experimental one. Uh, and basically participants were shown uh, and asked to evaluate a political campaign. And this was a fictional campaign sort of created for the purpose of this study, uh, promoting sort of the fictional Reconnect party. Um, and this party was designed to sort of reduce existing associations with UK political parties and also left right ideological associations. And the purpose of this was to sort of reduce those partisan ideological cues, which are, which are obviously strong heuristics informing trust evaluations, um, in an attempt to sort of experimentally isolate the effect of that digital imprint. And, and this was obviously quite, quite difficult to do. I won't talk about that in depth, but if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to ask away. So they viewed this campaign, uh, half participants saw, saw no imprints, half of them saw some, and then they were asked to rate the trustworthiness and untrustworthiness of the Reconnect Party, how they perceived it. So again, trust and distrust was measured on these uh, two separate dimensions. And then also recall of the digital imprint was used as a proxy for how much it was noticed. Um, and so this is just one example of one out of the four advertisements that they were shown. So on the right one there, you can see the digital imprint. It was sort of designed to be very visually intrusive. Um, and it says, uh, paid for by the Reconnect Party. And it information on the basis uh, of information about your income, age, and gen gender. So micro-targeting information was included there. Um, so yes, what did we find? So um, we recruited using the platform Prolific, uh, about 1,223 participants, which was about 600 in each uh, condition. Um, so using recall as this kind of proxy for how much the imprints were noticed. And on the whole, it was found that, they, that the recall rate was fairly high. However, you can see in that bottom column of the table there, this was for those in the transparency edition who incorrectly said they hadn't viewed this information when they had viewed it. So about a quarter, um, particularly a little bit higher there for, for micro-targeting information said that they hadn't viewed this information when, when they had. Um, so one of our hypotheses was, was did kind of a mistrusting political orientation predict higher recall? Um, and, and this wasn't supported. It was um, so in that left hand graph here, what, what this is plotting is the uh, probability of correct recall. And what this graph is basically showing um, along the x axis is, is, is how strongly someone participants had a mistrusting orientation. So for those who are highly mistrusting, they were sort of no more likely to correctly recall uh, viewing uh, digital in the information in the digital imprint. However, as you can see in these two right graphs, um, those who were highly distrusting and highly uh, trusting uh, were significantly less likely to correctly recall, which, which was sort of taken to suggest that they noticed it less uh, and the mechanism could perhaps be through um, sort of heuristic thinking or uh, making quicker judgments about, about the information that they saw. Uh, but it did appear uh, that they noticed them less, which sort of has implications for, for the effectiveness of what digital imprints are trying to achieve. And then moving on to the hypothesis about um, how the uh, how trustworthy the advertiser was perceived to be. So, so it's hypothesized that there would be a backfire effect for those who were strongly distrusting. Um, and this actually wasn't found. Um, there was no difference between conditions. Um, and, and also the political distrust was not actually found to be a strong predictor of how the um, uh, advertiser was perceived overall. So, so what this graph is showing is that the more distrusting a participant was, they were significantly more likely to distrust the advertiser, as you might expect. However, this was not a strong effect, and the effect size there measured through partial eta squared was, was sort of very small. So it didn't appear to be a particularly uh, strong driver of, of how those uh, trust judgments were made there. 
And then when looking at a mistrusting orientation, it was sort of hypothesized that those who were highly mistrusting would be more skeptical. Uh, and this was somewhat supported, but it was similar to, 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 distrust, uh, to distrust there, the distrusting orientation that, that although if you were more mistrusting, you were more likely to distrust the advertiser, this wasn't a particularly uh, strong effect. And, and also it didn't appear to reduce trust in the advertiser as these were, these were measured on those separate dimensions. Um, so what might be going on here? Well, well it was found that the most, the, the biggest sort of drivers of, of how trustworthy or untrustworthy the advertiser was perceived to be was sort of the, the, the content specifics of the advertisement. So this graph here, what the participants were asked was, was how much did you perceive the advertisements to be uh, sort of successfully targeted at themselves? So we attempted to give the sort of the illusion of that in the experiment. Um, and it was found that, yeah, so you could sort of interpret this as how happy would someone be to sort of see this pop up when they're browsing online? Um, and this was found to be, to be, as you might expect, a strong predictor of whether or not the advertiser was trusted. However, this was affected by the condition. Um, so this sort of benefit of successful targeting was, was lessened when participants were actively informed that they had been targeted. So, so this sort of shows a, a very small sort of potential backfire effect to um, the digital imprint there in terms of perceptions of the advertiser. Um, but what was found by far to be the strongest predictor of how much the advertiser was trusted was whether or not the, the message was agreed with uh, in the campaign. So you can see a very steep slope there. It was a very strong predictor with a, with a large effect size. Um, and, and we also checked not only whether or not the, the advertiser was sort of trusted on, the, on dimensions of, of competence, benevolence and integrity, uh, but also whether or not the advertisements were perceived as credible. Um, and, and the same effect here was found. So this is showing credibility in the advertisements. And what's kind of significant about this is that this is kind of regardless of if there was any way to actually verify if the ad was legitimate. So obviously it's hoped that digital imprints can be used as a way to assess its credibility. Um, and, and that didn't appear to kind of be, be used at this point in this way, which might have some implications. So sort of to sum up, um, there wasn't kind of evidence that the presence of this digital imprint was used uh, as, a, as a signal to trust the advertiser. Um, and what this might indicate is perhaps a lack of awareness of kind of the importance of this information in the digital imprint. It, it might not only be important that that information is there, but it might also need some sort of contextualization of, of why the information is there and how people should kind of be, be using this um, if it wants, if these uh, if this legislation was to sort of successfully decrease people's susceptibility to, to misinformation, um, or, or maybe it is enough to just to just inform, uh, that's the question. Um, however, there was no evidence to support large backfire effects in response to these um, digital imprints, which is good news for advertisers because it suggests that they won't be uh, unduly punished for being open and transparent and acting in line with these legislations. Um, and that was the key focus of what the study wanted to wanted to look at. Um, however, there was some evidence that strong political trusters and distrusters were sort of less likely to notice the imprints, um, potentially making them more susceptible to, to misinformation. Um, but also uh, methodologically, this suggests that it's also important to consider sort of these uh, predictors and how different individuals might react differently or process differently the, the same information when considering sort of uh, political transparency and, and the impact of it. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for listening. Um, yeah, I guess I'd be very interested to hear people's input of what they think might be useful to look at uh, next in, the, in, this, in this area. Um, so I guess the question that's on my mind is, do citizens need to be aware of the threat of misinformation for this information uh, to be useful? And I think that is already uh, being looked at uh, by some researchers sort of in this field. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Hazel. Uh, and experimental research design is also a very exciting thing to watch <laughs> as it progresses as a study. You can leave your questions for Hazel uh, in the chat box. Uh, remember that because she's going to answer along with the other panelists in the end of this panel. Okay, uh, following we have uh, Ana Julia Bonsanini Bernardi. Uh, she will be discussing her work on combating misinformation in the political sphere. Uh, she has prepared this work with, along with Rodrigo Stam. Ana Julia is visiting professor in political science at the Foundation School of Soci Sociology and Politics of Sao Paulo. Uh, she's a researcher and independent consultor, also a researcher at the Latin America Research Center, Nupesal.
She holds a PhD and a master's degree in political science from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And Professor Rodrigo Gonzalez is a PhD in political science and researcher at the Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, also in Brazil. Um, Ana Julia, uh, we are eagerly waiting for your insights. You can start your presentation. Thank you, Narda. Uh, Professor Rodrigo is also here with me. Uh, we will we'll share this presentation together. I start, Ana Julia. Okay. Uh, good afternoon for those in Americas. Good evening for those in Europe. Uh, we are discussing here uh, the challenges in Brazilian elections posed for, for the new technologies. Uh, next, uh, Julia. Uh, the problem today in Brazilian electoral elections is more a, pro a behavioral problem than uh, a legal problem. And we will, uh, we will discuss uh, how the Superior Electoral Court uh, tried to cope with these challenges. Next. Uh, the legal framework in Brazil is a strong framework for elections. We have uh, in the constitution uh, the framework for uh, radio and TV channels concessions, an internet law, a general protection law. Uh, we have a federal electoral court and elec uh, a Brazilian electoral system is a judicial system since 1932. Uh, composed by members of the Supreme Court in national level and for judges in the local level and an elect electoral code. So uh, the problem in Brazil for elections is not uh, a legal problem nor uh, a question of the system of voting, in more as uh, how to regulate uh, the, the elections. Uh, next, uh, Julian. Uh, in Brazil, the Electoral Court organized and rules about the campaigns. We have free time at radio and television. It's forbidden to pay for advertising in radio television. Uh, the elections are public funded. There is no super PACs in Brazil. Uh, contributions for uh, enterprise and corporations are forbidden. But there are freedom of internet and social enactor use. And in the election since 2018, abuse of the use of networks and social networks. Uh, the electoral court has to rule about the abuse. But the challenge is that uh, the electoral court is a bureaucratic one uh, that is prepared to cope with legal systems but not with new technologies. Uh, since uh, 2018, uh, we have uh, a strong use of uh, networks like WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, and others, sometimes in a, an illegal way. And uh, the problem is how the, uh, the court could regulate this. Uh, next, uh, Ana Julia. Uh, Brazilian political system has a lot of parties. We have 33 parties organized. Uh, it's possible just to have national parties. There is no local uh, or re regional parties. Today, we have 24 elected rep uh, parties with elected representatives. In the last election, we, have, we had uh, 11 presidential candidates in a two round system with ballotage. Uh, the system of voting in Brazil is reliable. We can count uh, 150 million votes in a presidential election in three hours, but uh, we cannot regulate social networks in a country with 
200,000 million people. Uh, so, Ana Julia will talk about how the courts tried to regulate and to cope with the question of uh, fake news and illegal use of social networks. Thank you, Rodrigo. Just uh, to, to contextualize a bit, uh, we have been cope, coping with misinformation, disinformation uh, long before internet and social network. But uh, since social media has become a, a major player uh, in electoral campaigns, things have been a bit uh, harder to uh, regulate. So following Brexit and the US 2016 election, in 2018, uh, Brazil also became a huge case study for disinformation. Uh, messaging apps such WhatsApp that like 93% of the population use in a daily basis uh, are pointed as major players in the spread of false claims regarding the electoral system. Uh, research shows that disinformation regarding electoral fraud, especially about the voting machines, was widespread in 2018 and also in 2022. Such claims were reinforced by Bolsonaro that won the election in 2018 and continued attacking the electoral system while in office. In this sense, since 2018, we had a long road of advances to prevent disinformation disorder in 2022. In this paper, we will, we will show in this presentation uh, the main regulation attempts that uh, were in order to try to counterfeit disinformation in the last four years and especially in 2022. So beginning with the initiatives on the Brazilian Congress, um, a mixed parliamentary commission of inquiry on fake news was set uh, right after 2018. And that led to many investigations that were undertaken by the superior justice to identify people that were funding these, uh, these, these illegal protests that asked for the, the closure of the parliament and the closure of the justice system. In 2020, we also started a discussion reg uh, regarding regulating social media platforms. That is the project of law 2630. It was approved in the Senate and is still under discussion in the Chamber of Deputies. Also a, seri a series of advances and discussions about media literacy took place on the Brazilian Congress, but so far haven't been implemented. So regarding the Superior Electoral Court and its huge role in, in conducting the, the elections in Brazil, and especially judging about what is to be considered misinformation and disinformation, uh, they have a, a, a very interesting program on misinformation uh, that they formed partnerships with 155, uh, 54 key players especially social media platforms. Uh, there, was, there were also uh, different apps that were introduced to try to in, improve whistleblowers of irregularities, such as the Pardo app and a chatbot on WhatsApp. Also, the Supreme Federal Court uh, is currently conducing two investigations related to disinformation and threats to democracy. And a second one focused on the origins uh, and funding of groups that promote anti-democratic speech. Uh, a third pillar that was very important, especially in 2020, 2022 elections was uh, regarding NGOs, academics, media, and fact-checking agencies. It's impossible to, to explain all of them. So we, we tried to focus on three main areas here. One of them was the disinformation articulation room, uh, DAR, 
and uh, that promoted many uh, awareness uh, on this information and strategies. Uh, this was a group that was get, gathered more than 150 different actors from the third sector, influencers, journalists, researchers, uh, technology, democracy, and political experts that came together to demand more effective measures and adherence to community guidelines from technology companies and digital platforms. We published three main reports that addressed the, re the relationship between digital platforms and political disinformation, highlighting the dangers it posed to the ongoing electoral process. Uh, a second important pillar are the fact-checking agencies, uh, such as Lupa, Projeto Comprova, Aos Fatos, and many more that set criteria to ensure transparency and reliability in news reporting, as well as different rumors that was uh, widespread during the election time. Uh, a third pillar, and last but not least on this uh, NGO sector was the project uh, Democracy at Stake. Um, democracy well, at Stake uh, is a hub of researchers in the field of sociology, political communication, political science, journalism, and net activism that acted as a major player, not only in providing information to electoral authorities uh, regarding disinformation claims and anti-democratic behavior, but also work it together with the press to inform society about key political events in the recent period. Between uh, March 2021 and August 2022, weekly reports were produced summarizing the main narratives uh, from different segments uh, in social media, especially uh, rights, rights uh, extreme right supremacists and also uh, disinformation regarding evangelicals and security forces. These reports were based on monitoring Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, and also during the election period, um, WhatsApp and Telegram. And uh, we consider a list of relevant actors mainly in the rights, right, uh, rights wing, but also uh, relevant actors uh, on society, especially their claims on anti-democratic behavior. Uh, a third pillar is the so-called auto-regulation from the social platforms. They, they, entered, they presented many measures that they should be taken during the elections to, promote, uh, to prevent misinformation and disinformation. But so far, as we can see, and also related to the events that took place after the elections, they haven't been doing that good job. So after the elections, we had the terrorist attacks on Brasilia in the 8th January, and we see the, the efforts of the social media still as insufficient, and uh, we, we address the, the urgent need of re further regulation. Um, in this sense, uh, doing a parallel to COVID-19, uh, many, many posts that uh, happened during the pandemic, they uh, and invite uh, and also addressed denialism, uh, were tagged as false and took down by these uh, platforms. But the the same accountability wasn't uh, enforced regarding uh, fraud on the elections and uh, regarding anti-democratic behavior. So looking at the 2022 elections, what, what we can address, what we can say that uh, we, we improved from 2018, the confidence in the electronic voting system increased. Almost 80% of, of Brazilians trust the system. 
the number of valid votes also increased. Uh, it was 11 million more than in 2018. Uh, but despite all the efforts, according to the Superior Court, there was a uh, more than 1,000% increase uh, in the volume of disinformation between the first and the second term. In this sense, the electoral court during the second term took new actions to prevent disinformation. Social media uh, was obliged to take down posts uh, after they were ruled. They only had two hours. Previously, previously it was 24 out 48 hours. So no, uh, another claim was that no posts could be boosted and platforms were prohibited to display advertising for candidates uh, 24 hours before the second term. The court could set temporary suspension of profiles, accounts, or channels on social networks in which the systematic production of fake news was identified. So going to the final considerations, uh, we see that uh, democracy in general uh, despite the, the events that happened on 8 January is stronger in Brazil, but measures taken by so social media are still ineffective compared to the level of organization displayed by the Bolsonarist social media militias. Polarization fueled misinformation on the second turn, especially regarding religion, corruption, and economic terrorism, moral panic. Despite the increased level of misinformation, people are more aware of the dangers of fake news, especially after the pandemic. So the adherence to those was decreased in comparison to 2018, but still we had a very radical group that uh, took on terrorism acts on 8 January. So in general, <laughs> just some pin points of our, of our paper. Uh, we are very eager to hear your comments and thank you for listening.